Amazing. Good Lord alive. Really? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> How long have you actually been collecting Noritake porcelain? Uh, about a year and a half. But the original piece um, that I started with was uh, my mother's, which I've had about 30 years, right. something like that. Which is, the, you brought it That's with you? These two vases. This pair? Yes. Okay. She actually swapped me because she fancied the pair that I had, so we swapped. And I had a large mantelpiece which to fit on. So it took you 30 years really to get into the, uh, the idea of collecting the stuff? Yeah, we, we never knew what it was at all. It had, you know, we'd never heard of it. So right. uh, we just happened to see some other pieces with the same mark on. Okay, so what was the, uh, the first purchase? was the bowl. This bowl here? Yes. I think what is remarkable about Noritake is that 25 years ago, you couldn't give the stuff away. No. Nobody no. wanted it. And then, you know, we'd get the odd American turning up and buying it, and it really has become very much a sort of um, a, a US-dominated market. Yes. However, having said that, I, I know that you're aware that there is a, a UK collector's yes, club. Yes, there is. Yes. And there's a lot more information yes. coming out about Noritake. Yes. What is great about Noritake, I think, is the fact that it was very much an international concern. Yes. Because the design team were in New York, yes. headed by an Englishman, yes. uh, making porcelains for, uh, in Japan yes. uh, for the European and the, uh, and the American, American market. Yeah. So it was all, it was all very clever. Yeah. We think of international yeah. companies today. Yeah. Um, they well, did they... copy a lot of other styles. I mean, there's quite a bit that's on the style of Wedgwood as well. Oh, yes. So there's, there's quite a lot of different styles. Well, the one to look out for is the abstract designs that you often get on, on plates mm. designed by none other than Frank Lloyd Wright. I don't like it. You don't like it? <laughs> no, I like the pretty pieces. Oh, do you? Rather. Mm. Right, mm. You've, so you've got definite set views about what you want to collect in your Noritake. Yes. I think where they win is, as with that bowl and, 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 and this piece, whereas in Staffordshire, in the sort of 1920 period, much of what was being mass produced was being transfer printed. Right. Noritake went one better, yes. and they actually hand painted pieces. Yes. Now, if you look at this, you know, you, oh, each one of those roses um, is entirely hand painted. Yes. And uh, that makes it special. Also, they, um, they didn't um, go easy on the gilt as yeah. well. So it's what I call bright and bonny. Yes. Um, so um, I've got to say that the pair of vases is quite splendid. Yes. Um, I think that, I don't know how much you've, you've paid for them, but if I can just say that I would expect today that you would have to pay around about 200 to 250 pounds. Yes, we paid 210 for them, so. That was a near one, wasn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> and um, I, all I can say is um, thank you for sharing a little bit of um, Early 20th century Japan with yes. us here in, um, in Hartlepool. Lovely, you're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. First sight, we've got a little Chinese sauce boat dating from the um, middle of the 18th century, an export ware piece decorated in Fami Rose enamels. Uh, the inside is particularly uh, closely based on uh, a Kinlong export piece, and these little precious objects around here again suggest China. But of course, this is not China. Uh, this is English. Uh, you knew that, did you? No. You didn't. No. Um, it is, uh, and it's actually a very rare little piece. It's been moulded with these petal forms, and then also with a sort of chinoiserie landscape. It's not really true Chinese. It's in the style of, and these rococo scrolls. It's a very early piece of Worcester porcelain, made just at that changeover period when Lunds Bristol came to Worcester about 1751-52, very early. Um, it's what we call Wigornia type because there is a class of source boat with the word Wigornia, which is the Latin for Worcester, on it, and it's given its name to this class of porcelain. I see. So, where, I mean, did you buy it uh, as what? It was purchased into the family about 30 years ago now. Oh, really? But, uh, Do you know what as? Well, actually, it, it was, uh, wasn't noticed at the time. Wasn't it? We had a tray of <clears throat> um, different odds and ends, little oh, yeah. things, glassware and sort of things, oh, and yeah. this was amongst them. 
Was it? And uh, just purchased for a couple of pounds. Well, it is actually amongst the most important pieces of early English porcelain we've ever had on a roadshow. I mean, it really is. It's a very rare little object. My goodness. Now, it's tragedy, if it has one, yes. is we've got a crack here. Now, this is actually a firing crack. This has been in the manufacture, and it's opened up a bit and split a bit further. We've also got a chip under the spout. But it's not, for a piece of this age and importance, it's not that bad. It's slightly speculative when you've got damage like this coming up with an estimate. I would give a wide estimate on this, somewhere between five and ten thousand pounds. No. Good Lord life. Not bad for a couple of quid's worth of junk on a tray, is it? <laughs> Interesting. You may have um, thought when you came today that this was going to go to the picture people, but you've ended up in porcelain. Yes. Um, for the obvious reason is that it's a picture painted on porcelain. Yes. And the picture people then promptly deny it's anything to do with them at all, and it becomes a completely different category. Right. Which is ridiculous, really, because all this is is a painting on a slab of porcelain which the painter has bought in exactly in the same way as a painter would buy in uh, a canvas there's no difference here where did it come from it in fact is my parents but my great grandfather bought it he was a keen amateur artist himself. Oh, really? Uh, yes, yes, but... Uh, he didn't do this? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't he that good? No, it wasn't that good, no, no. But he obviously took a fancy to it and right. bought it. You don't know where or when? I'm afraid I don't, know. No, no. no, that would have been um, interesting. Not, yes. What it is, we've got a couple of very attractive young ladies looking into the distance here beautifully photographically painted. Yes. I mean, the skill needed to produce these flesh tones. Mm -hmm. Their skin is translucent. Yeah. It's fantastic yes. work. Yes. And we have, as a bonus, been given a signature, Angeline Dubois, dated 1843. Yes. Right. This was probably a salon painting um, of the time. What I would like to do, could, could I just take it out of the back? I'm sure you can, yes. They're I, not going to mind, are they? I don't think so. It's only a bit of sticky tape. Yes, so, it's... out comes a Swiss Army penknife, and off we go. Uh... What have we got? Nothing. Oh. We may have got something which we can't see. Let's have a look. No. Normally on these, you would expect to find a Berlin mark. Yes. Which is a scepter. Um, the other thing one might have found was a, a Meissen mark, because Meissen made some blanks as well. Yeah. All we've got is a, an inventory number, 2077. So we're actually no better off no. having taken the back off. No. Usually you find something. From a value point of view, we pretend that it's not the Virgin Mary and St Mary Magdalene. Right. Because if it's a religious painting, it's worth nothing like as much as if it's a secular painting. <laughs> so what we've got here is an attractive pair of young girls, yes, OK? Yes, right. Oddly enough, the market for these mm. is Japan. Yes. They love this sort of photographic style yes. and pretty ladies. Um, I think it would sell extremely well, even in today's somewhat depressed market. Um, I think we're looking at four to six thousand pounds. Oh, really? Very nice, yes. So I hope yes. your parents are going to be pleased. I'm sure they will. <laughs> they, oh, It'll stay in the family, though. That's good. Just yes. a few more tin tacks and a bit of sticky tape. Yes, and be... yes. And I bagged it as well. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very yes. much. Thank you very much, too. Thank you. Are these part of a collection of yours? No, they came out of an actual fireplace in the house. Uh, your house? Yes, in St Bees. In St Bees. How many were there? There's about 14 complete and some with some chips and some broken. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yes. Do you know anything about their age or anything? No, no, no. Really. Well, uh, this one here is signed Sadler Liverpool, mm -hmm. and that is the maker, uh, or rather the printer of these tiles. And they were, in fact, um, made in Liverpool in the middle of the 18th century, just mm -hmm. after. In 1756, he actually swore an affidavit that he and his partner, uh, Guy Green, printed as many tiles in six hours 
as a hundred skillful pot painters could actually paint. So it was a first very you know successful manufacturing mm -hmm. process, uh, and then they continued to to manufacture these for uh, houses and like your fireplace and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, they're now very rare, very collectible. Um, this one is a lovely picture. You've got the sailor's farewell. You can see she's crying as she uh, lover goes out to sea and then she's coming back here and he's giving her a present of a watch and so on and that's probably the one the sign one is probably society of foresters or something like that but they say they are rare and each one of those at least 100 pounds possibly 120 and the signed one very nearly 200 mm -hmm. so when you get it home get your calculator out and work it out <laughs> but it's well over 2000 pounds i would have thought for those you rescued so tell your husband it was worthwhile doing my great uncle traveled uh, on the grand tour of the far east at, um, sometime between 1900 and 1920 i suppose yes and uh, he brought back a great number of artifacts from right the east the first thing any visitor to Japan has to bring back is some souvenir of Mount Fuji. Of course. We've got a porcelain vase and we've got a piece of enamel. Which of these two would you go for? The vase. The vase, this little vase? Yes. I okay. think that is absolutely exquisite. Well, it's very nicely done and it is covered in a celadon glaze with a, a bit of slip, just giving that suggestion of snow on the cap of, of Fuji, and there is the potter's mark. Well, you've chosen a very modest piece. That would yeah. not cost you more today mm -hmm. than maybe um, 30 pounds. Oh. So you, you, you would, you would, would you have paid 35 pounds for this, maybe? Possibly, yeah. So I don't, I'm not as fond of that. If you look around the edge of this, you'll yeah. see that it has an outline. The enamels are laid into an outline, mm -hmm. or cloisons, as they're yes. called. Technically, this is cloisonné, mm -hmm. but the central part of this theme is, is done completely without wires. Mm -hmm. This is what the Japanese call the muzen. Mm -hmm. And there's one particular exponent of it, a man called Namikawa Sasuke, who's a highly prized worker in muzen enamel. Mm -hmm. I suspect this is by him. Right. And if it weren't for the fact that there is um, a bruise on the corner, yeah. this little tray would not cost you 35 pounds, but today would have cost you somewhere in the region of 2,000, 3,000 pounds. Mm. But that bruise does make a difference. I'm afraid so, So yes. knock off a naught. It's still more than mm -hmm. your charming little vase. Yes. Choose a piece of satsuma wear. Which of these two do you prefer? The one with the wisteria inside. The one with the wisteria. Yes. Well, let's have a look first at this one. That's a cherry, I think. And here you have a scene of people outside a, a large wheeled uh, vehicle. I mean, this is a sort of Lord's Mayor procession yes. in Japanese version. But this is not the one you want. That's the one I wouldn't. You choose. want this one? I would choose the other one. Why? Because of the wisteria inside. This is the bit you like. This is the part I like. Yeah. The sparrows flying through wisteria. That's right. I have that in my garden, and it looks beautiful. It is gorgeous. So it's sentimental, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I tell you, of these two pieces. Um, you prefer the second? Yes. If I tell you the first of these... It's the more valuable. It's worth somewhere in the region of two to three hundred pounds. Yes. The second one is by a man called Yabu Meizan. Mm -hmm. This is the one you've chosen. That's the one I would like, yes. This is worth somewhere between two and three thousand pounds. Really? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> You've got the right piece. I've got the right one. <laughs> Tell me, what do you know about these? I know very little about them. They were left to me by my late brother, and all I do know is that he thought they were from the Dutch East India Company. And we come from South Africa, and my brother lived in Cape Town. If you and he thought there might have been a Dutch East India Company link, presumably you think you know that they're Chinese, do you? I have no idea where they've come from. Nothing at all. <laughs> Right. They are Chinese. Okay. They're Chinese. Um, and they are based on English silver originals of about 1720, right? But actually, these date from about 1760. So they were copying something which was out of date by 30, 40, 50 years even, maybe. But they are 1760. 
They're quite rare survivors. Really? Another interesting point about this, when the Chinese model this or cast it uh, or mould it, um, they fire it in the kiln, take it out, glaze it and fire it at full temperature. The first firing is just to harden it off. And normally nothing happens at that first hardening up off stage. But this one has split. Now normally you chuck it away. But this cost in Chinese terms quite a lot of money to make is a complicated object. So rather than dump it, they filled it with glaze and fired it. Right? So it then comes down, it's taken from Qing to Zhen, where it's uh, made and glazed, all the way down to Canton, where the decoration is put on. Okay. And this would have been done specially to European taste, and I think French taste. I think this is Company des Andes, made for the French market. Okay. Beautifully decorated, hand painted in Fami Rose enamels, unusual with this iron red band of stiff leaves around here, not common at all. They are, apart from that firing crack, which doesn't count, they're in perfect condition. You like them, do you? Um, I'm not mad about them, but they're How sentimental. Not mad? Well, they've got sentimental value, so they, they are very special. Well, the thing about way. sentimental value is that you offer enough that it will overcome it. Possibly. <laughs> £2,000? No. Or 3000 No. Okay, no. that's as hard as I can get. Yeah. Well, maybe three and a half. No, I think I would rather, rather because of the them. memory of my brother, yes. Well, that's a nice thing to remember him by. I think they're utterly, utterly charming, and you're very, very lucky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I first met the pot about 35 years ago in Reading, in the house in wow. Reading. The lady that I got it from was a relation of my husband's right and when she moved to Canada later on she she gave the pot to me well what is so incredibly rare about this uh, is that this piece is uh, a piece of imperial Chinese porcelain it's made for the imperial court or pretty close to it it's it's very very fine example of what you might call uh, classicism in China in the 18th century it's a it's an old shaped vessel it's called a ho h-o it's painted in underglazed cobalt blue under this rather um, thick and grainy glaze, very typical of this period. And it's painted with, uh, I suppose, designs which are really quite traditional. Uh, the lotus on the, on the neck up here, and then these moti motifs down all the way around the belly of the pot. I don't know if you know what they are. Well, I, I recognize that these are carp. Oh, yes. Right, and right, uh, yeah. chrysanthemum. But these are all. Buddhist motifs, and these are called the eight Buddhist emblems. In fact, this one round here, uh, this one, this curious one round here, is um, called the Endless Knot, which in fact really is an indication, it actually is an icon for the entrails, believe it or not, of Buddha. And uh, it's a motif that's almost Byzantine. And the next one is uh, the twin fish, which in fact ultimately means, uh, I suppose, a symbol of marital harmony. So all these things say something about uh, connected with a religion, if you like, in the Far East. But it's, um, what is, is special about this is that it has the rain mark and the seal mark of the emperor. And there it is there. There we have the seal mark of the emperor Qianlong. And this is actually painted, the style of this is painted in, I suppose, early Ming, early Ming, early 15th century style, that's why. It, they're re looking at old shapes, old designs, and incorporating on this vessel. So we're talking about something pretty rare. Mm. Some of these vessels are, do have lids. I this was one, wondering if it, it would have, doesn't, some doesn't some look as if it ever had a no. lid, and yet... It could do. And um, in perfect state, this is worth many tens of thousands of pounds. This piece here is broken. I'm not saying you've broken it, but it's broken. It's an old break. It's an old break. Yeah. We're dealing with a market which is concerned with perfection and uh, in terms of material, the Chinese market, the people who buy this will want things in mint state, so they won't pay tens and tens of thousands of pounds. They will probably pay maybe five or ten thousand pounds for a repaired piece. That's what this is worth, somewhere between five and ten thousand pounds. 
it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've got a sort of range of pieces here. I mean, this is the most unusual clock. Um, where did this one come from? Well, that was given to my grandparents on the occasion of their marriage in uh, oh, right. January 1907. Oh, right. Well, we can probably sort of get quite close to it by looking at the year code. Uh, Worcester put a code on all their pieces. We've got the mark underneath, which is somewhat smudged there, counting the dots, 12, We've got 1905 it was made. Oh. So, uh, in stock a, a year or two, then given in that, in that occasion. Most unusual to get porcelain clocks. And a little painted scene there, uh, not signed by the artist, but I think that's probably the work of William Hawkins. Oh. A great flower nice painter. I, mean, it, I, I say one feels with the porcelain painters and the artists at Worcester that you always know them because living in Worcester myself, as I did, that, that fam their families are all around. And Dad introduced me to so many of the painters and people whose artists and signed on your pieces of porcelain. Uh, are some of these by your, fam your family members? Yes. Um, my grandmother was a Files. Her maiden name was Files. Uh -huh. And Madge Files, who worked at the Porcelain Works for a short while, um, was her niece. And I feel very privileged to have two pieces that were actually painted by painted her. Painted by her. Um, probably not of great value, but uh, they are to the members of my family. Well, but they become special pieces, aren't they? Yes. yes I mean, the great painter of roses, particularly, yes. and flowers, and that sort of atmospheric, shaded background, yes. which, which Worcester so specialised in. Yes. But that's yes. the nice thing. And then, then your family have been collecting and buying pieces after that. Uh, my father, particularly, had a great love of Worcester china. Mm -hmm. um, and this is part of what he has left yes. to me. Did he know the painters himself? I'm not sure whether my father actually knew, but certainly my grandfather, mm -hmm. who was a well-known character in mm -hmm. Worcester, mm -hmm. he certainly knew Harry Davis and the Stintons. Right, and we can see, see their work here. I mean, of course, Harry Davis um, means a lot to my family because Dad knew him very well. I was just a very young boy. I was eight years, nine years old when I met Harry Davis and would spend hours as a boy watching him paint. And I could see the, the magic name Harry Davis on this one. We've got some very unusual pieces to get this subject. He's famous really for his French style landscapes and sheep. Here you've got a little cottage scene. Yes. I and mean, that's very unusual to find. What gorgeous flowers growing up there. You can imagine yourself sitting by the cottage as of course Harry would have done. He did little sketches and watercolours of local scenes. Is that a local building, do you know? I, have, I would think it's somewhere around Worcester, but I just, I I just feel that the uh, flowers look as if they're almost growing. They come out as if they're alive. Absolutely amazing. I mean, that's the magic of porcelain. Mm. Somehow the colours are sealed there and they never change. We're looking at them now as they were painted. Mm. And a great big vase there by another marvellous artist. Um, there's the work of Charlie Baldwin. Um, bird lover through and through and sweeping swans growing around there. I mean, nowadays, collectors are, of course, keen on wares, and the value goes very much by who painted them. And uh, a little vase by Madge Files will be £250, a cup and saucer about 100 so not little bad. But moving up in the scale of the artist's work, your clock, which was their wedding present clock, family piece, is going to be, for its rarity alone, probably £800, £1,000. Then moving up to the top artists and Harry Davis there on a vase and cover with an unusual scene. I suppose it's going to be £5,000. Pardon? £5,000 now for Harry Davis vase. In, the painters themselves would have been shocked at these values. He'd never, never earned that in his life, poor old Harry. But oh, here, so a vase nice. that size, in that quality, you're probably £8,000. Pardon? And a vase by Charlie Baldwin is going to be £7,000. Goodness me. Now, I mean, it makes you think, really, when these were made as labours of love by the artists, as great bits of porcelain, but now they're expensive treasures too. I was a sister at the Royal London Hospital and I wore this uniform. You wore this exact I uniform? I wore a uniform exactly like that. It, it looks like a 19th century design of costume. Yes, over the years it's been modified and redesigned and we were literally held together with pins. <laughs> the, <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> because of washing, going to the laundry, we had real mother of pearl buttons. So these buttons here were mother of pearl, pearl and held in by pins. Held in by pins. The collar was held on at the back by pins. <laughs> when we were on duty, the sleeves detached from here 
and you undid the cuffs and you took the sleeve off. Well, that's, it's a wonderful story about the uniform and, of course, this marvellous story that you actually wore this and yes. that, of course, makes it very special to you. It does, indeed. But it is, in fact, still a special object in its own right. It's a limited edition. It's one of only 500 that were made. Now, with limited editions, not just raw Worcester limited editions, the value tends to go down. This is because they are often sold at high prices to begin with, and there are usually quite a lot of them, and there simply isn't the demand, so they fall in price. But this is an exception. This one, it is such a charming one, that most of them were bought, like you, by members of the sisters and the doctors and the staff, so they very rarely come on the market. Today, this, with its certificate and its box, came up at auction would make a thousand to twelve hundred and fifty pounds. Really? And it's still going up. It's rather precious to yes. me. This uh, reminds me of my youth. <laughs> Do you find it fun? No, I think it's quite a ugly thing. I, I've never been, I've never looked at it with a great deal of pleasure. So it's not anything you treasure at home at all? No, it hasn't really. Mm. It's been in various places such as under the stairs and different places and it's never been a thing that I would think, oh that is nice I'd like to keep it that's awful because it's to me it's got so much charm it's sort of a cartoon like quality I find um, which so many of this sort of figure tends to represent it's so appealing uh, it's the work of a potter um, known as lovely name Obadiah Sherratt he was working in Staffordshire in the 1820s and his groups are very typified by these high score bases and the marvellous mixed up scale of his portraiture. We've got little tiny sheep and the figures I mean, completely dwarfing the castle which they're supposed to be standing beside. I know of a couple of versions of this model. Um, one misses out the sheep altogether but they always have a tower on both sides of the figure. And here, rather amusingly, um, the second tower broke off during the making. But rather than scrap the piece, they went ahead and just cut it down, painted over it and glazed it, and so you wouldn't know, and it's no longer there. So you presumably don't think it's a totally valuable piece. Well, no, I've, oh, I've never really thought of it as any, no, anything. It's just been there. And, uh, oh. Um, recently, some incredibly high prices have been paid uh, in sales for the work of Sherratt. Um, his quick groups of circus performers and local social history of Staffordshire, which many of these pieces represent, are seriously sought by collectors nowadays. And I can understand, probably find several collectors will be quite willing to pay £2,000 for this group. Oh, golly Moses, I can hardly believe that. Well, when you think how I've looked at it, I've never even had any pleasure from looking at it. I, I find it difficult to... Mm. So it's, it's a primitive sort of pleasure that, honestly, to me, I see it very differently to you. But yes. I hope perhaps you'll now, after realising this, you'll look at it in a new light. I should light. cherish it, I should think, from now onwards. Isn't that the best thing you've seen all day? It's the best thing I've seen for an extremely long time. That's, that has got to be one of the most wonderful bits of mice I've handled for, well, certainly some time, anyway. It's amazing, isn't it? And it's mint. And it's got his lid! It's got an old collector's label there. <gasps> I think that's absolutely wonderful. Real gem. And tea caddy collectors, mice and collectors, everybody would want that. How much do you think it's worth? Well, I think about... around about 10,000. I wouldn't dispute that. I think you're spot on. Oddly enough, this was made in the same place as that. Oh, right. It's from Kutani in K Kaga province in Japan, about 1880. Right. What's so nice about it is the subject matter. Yes, lovely. You've got this wonderful fat... Mm. I'm not even sure he's an owl. I think he's an owlette. He's a baby yes, owl, isn't he? Yes, I think it? so, too. Um, and what's nice, though, is the way he's sitting there, sort of looking at his lunch. Yes. <laughs> he's about <laughs> yeah. to put this claw yeah. down and go, yes. oh, breakfast, lunch, lovely. Mm. Do you, you liked it, too, did you? Yeah, I think it's absolutely lovely. Yeah. It's particularly the shape. You want to touch you it all to the touch time. You want to touch it, yes. yes. And, of course... Yeah. The colour around the back is quite breathtaking. Yes. And this particular green colour, very characteristic of Kutani, mm. as is this mixture of black on green. Mm. Again, something mm. uh, you would expect mm. to come from there. Mm. Well, I think it's a marvellous thing. Mm. Where did this one come from? Um, well, that was left to my mother. Um, she'd visited the, the house of an elderly couple who 
did collect antiques um, and admired it. In fact, as she went past it, she stroked it and uh, didn't meet them again for many years. But when the, the, uh, the wife died, she left it to my mother in her will. Oh, wonderful. Because she'd admired it. Oh, so. isn't that nice? Yeah. I think um, that would fetch somewhere between uh, 1,800 and 2,500 pounds. Wow. Well, we must continue to keep it on a high shelf. <laughs> I've only seen this model once before, that was a couple of years ago, but I fell in love with it then because it seems to show so movingly the hard life of the American Indian. It, it's rather nice, isn't it? It's a bit sort of gruesome, I suppose, in a way, looking down at the, at the skull of a, a, a dead companion in some way, long dead um, Indian scout. There's a story about that. One of the grandsons uh, had nightmares about that very skull. He, he couldn't stand it. It was so gruesome for him. I can understand that in a way, but yeah. otherwise, apart from that, it's such a, a fine sculpture. It, in a way, it's a surprising model to come from the Meissen factory. It's, isn't uh, it? it's yeah, not Spanish. typically German study mm. at all. And this is about as good in its period as the finest wares of the 18th century. What would you call the period? This would, I would have thought, about 1900, mm. something like mm. that, um, getting very much stylized. I don't know the modeler. Um, it's, the animal is so well modeled. I think it's probably a good animal sculpt like Essa or someone, but it's unfortunately not signed. It does have the, all the clear marks you expect to see on a Meissen figure. The cross swords yes. there, um, absolutely genuine, one of the most imitated marks of all time, but that's as yeah. a mark should be. But the nice thing to look for, it has also the model numbers in thrust into the clay. So it does. The um, a letter, a letter followed by numbers, and that's mm. the sort of serial number you'd expect on a Meissen figure. Uh, written in by hand, and it's another little workman number in press. It's got the signs that Meissen should have, and that proves, together with the quality... You could say that's genuine Meissen. That it's, it's a Meissen figure, and, and a jolly fine one, and a rare piece indeed. Um, not an easy thing to put a value on. Did you think yourself it was a, what, what it was worth? I had it valued several years ago in Upminster uh, by a gentleman who... I think he knew what he was talking about. He said it was worth £150, but I thought then, and I think now, it's worth considerably more than that. That's right, it has to be, because not only is it rare, it's such an impressive piece. Yeah. I suppose, I think you can almost add a naught, I would have thought £1,200, £1,500. Really? Mm. So I've got to tell my insurance company. You paid a couple of pounds Yes, right? obviously, I like the shape and, um, I'll say, the decoration. Do you know where it was made? I don't know. It's, um, it just appealed to me when I actually saw it, and obviously... It's quite early, of course. Right. It's Worcester porcelain. Oh, right. Worcester factory started in 1751. Yeah. And this is within two or three years of the factory starting, shall oh, we gracious. say, 52, 53. Yeah. So it's 240 odd uh, years ago. And the decoration inside is recorded as a right. standard book on Worcester blue and white. Okay. But the decoration here on this side, I think, is completely unrecorded. Right. There would have been a pair of them originally, right. and they would have been about one and sixpence a pair, Good something gosh. like yeah. that. Would £500 surprise you? Good gracious, it certainly yeah. would, yes. Well, yes. you can multiply it by three, really, sort of £1,500. Uh, pounds. So Gee, your I mean. car boot sale oh, is, That was uh, uh, well worth bringing in. Yes. Good gracious. <laughs> Being so close to Worcester today, I hoped I'd see some nice Worcester porcelain, but you brought along a really very special piece, and uh, you know, the, the likes of which I've never seen before. Oh, tell me about it. Well, it's, it's made by uh, the Grangers in George Granger's time, and mm -hmm. it's come down through the family. Uh, in fact, uh, I've just established that George Granger was my great-great-grandfather. Grangers were, were they one of the great porcelain makers yes. In, yes. in Worcester. Yes. In, Here's the name on the back, G. Granger & Co. Worcester. And they were the, the other Worcester factory, the smaller factory, the other side of the city. And Paul Granger is generally thought of as being not, not nothing on the same league as the great Royal Worcester factory. But here is a piece that shows just how good Granger could be. We, we think it was made about uh, 1840 and it's been handed down generation and, and loved. And um, the story that my mother told me was that um, it's an extra from a, a set that was made for Queen Victoria to give the Tsar. But we haven't been able to corroborate this. Uh, in fact, we approached the um, Worcester Museum, who had mm. no record of it. 
and yes. the Hermitage oh. in, in Russia. Oh, well, right, so you've been researching yes. all around. and the Royal Collection. And the Royal yes. Collection right. also yeah. had no mm. record. Looking at the piece, it has, of course, proud mm. in the middle. Mm. Um, there are the arms of Queen Victoria. And in the panels around the border, you've got the different royal palaces. What, you've got Windsor Castle there. Mm -hmm. Yes. That must be Buckingham Palace. And I think so. And with the little figures, charming figures in the foreground there. And there we've got the pavilion at Brighton. Yes. Are they mm. hand-painted? Um, beautifully hand-painted. We've looked at it through a magnifying glass and it's amazing. The gilding there, uh, this amazing rays and barbs, I mean, it's just unlike any other English royal services. Um, all the factories made pieces for Queen Victoria and for William IV beforehand, but this is so much more splendid, more eccentric than that. Mm. Um, we know that um, there were pieces made for the Queen Victoria and uh, services which went back and forward between um, England and Russia, but this never went, this stayed in the family, so is this some sort of sample? I mean, with this quality, why didn't they get the order, I wonder? But what I've never seen before on Grange or any other factories is these model flowers stuck on the plates in addition. The little roses are each made by hand and stuck on. Yes, you couldn't eat off of it, could you? Uh, not, not very easy. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, imagine even in a royal palace trying to carve your feet off there. Maybe it was just a, a bit too silly. They just gone, yes. they gone over the top, mm. and the order wasn't placed. How do you value a royal plate in a family like that? Have you thought about it? No. Well, we thought, but uh, I not, we don't know. It's not even insured. Oh. I mean, maybe four thousand pounds. Thank you. Excellent. Well, there's a splendid collection of Staffordshire figures you've brought along. Have you been collecting for a long time? Uh, yes, this collection was compiled over about a 20-year period, mainly in the 60s and 70s. Oh, so these were bought when these things were not quite as fashionable as they are now? That's right. A, a yeah. lot of the smaller figures were yeah. around sort of £15. Pounds. These, are, these are very interesting figures because most of them were made in the 1820s and 1830s, and they have this uh, bocage, this... Um, front light thing and behind uh, and this is really in imitation of the 18th century figures I'm sure you know like Chelsea and so on it's a part of the revived Rococo to have these as part of their style uh, and they really are very remarkable but then in another way they are just sort of peasant art they're not very sophisticated and at the time they were made they were very inexpensive uh, to buy people just uh, got them at fairgrounds and so on and they reflected the life of the times. They actually predate, of course, the Staffordshire flatback figure, I'm sure you know yes. that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd particularly like this figure, Songsters, and there you see she is playing a triangle, he's playing some kind of flute. It's a wonderful figure, that. And on the back, we have the mark, Walton. Yes. Now, Walton, of course, John Walton, who was potting from um, 1820 to 1846, and is principally known for this kind of figure. So that's a rare figure. And it's uh, one of a pair. And it's one of a pair. And then here we've got this ram, um, and again you've got the bocage at the background, and we turn him round again, and another name, which is a very rare name, Selman. Now, um, Selman, I don't know if I've ever seen another Selman mark piece. He was a potter who came after John Walton in the 1860 uh, period, 64, 65. And that's an extremely rare figure. Um, you can perhaps see on it there has been some repair. And this is one of the problems with these figures, yeah. I'm sure you realise. Yes. And that affects the price. Um, the figures have gone up a great deal in price since you paid 15 or 20 pounds or whatever it was for them. Those nowadays, um, with the mark, are getting on for something in the region of 750, even a thousand pounds for one that's not been restored. Not for a pair for or for a pair. For the pair. Yeah. No, 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 sorry. Each. 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 They're staggering. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've gone up enormously. And as for the others, um, they will range dependent on the amount of damage, the amount of restoration, uh, the rarity of the figure. A bit like postage stamps, but they will range over anything from three to seven or eight hundred pounds each. It's very pleasing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> She's got all her original clothes, and someone has looked after her so well. So 
either your mother or your grandmother must have really cherished her. Mm. And it's strange that a gentleman should own a doll, isn't it, now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I take it you don't play with her. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, she's French. She's made a bisque, which is probably, as you know, um, unglazed porcelain. But the interesting thing is we call them swivel head dolls or fashionable dolls because they were made to wear the costume of the day and this would have been um, around 1860. So you're definitely your grandmother's. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it could well have been um, imported into England after the Great Exhibition of 1851. Mm -hmm. and imported actually without any clothes on and then um, the clothes might have been made in England. She's got all her lovely underwear and um, the boots which are wonderful heeled leather boots and they have a mark underneath which is a T and I think it's a T for Terren which also was uh, a doll maker and made clothes in Paris. In Paris so she's, um, really so she's all wonderfully French. original. My mother must have been careful with her. She then, must she have been. To play with. She <laughs> must have been. And you've had her just tucked away in a box. Oh, oh yes, in a cabinet, yeah. I think for insurance, you should be insuring her for £3,000. <laughs> Amazing. I know. <laughs> a very fine quality continental porcelain vase in the style of Sèvres. Not Sèvres. Oh, it isn't. But no. Oh. Sèvres never made anything quite like this, um, but many people in the 19th century did Sèvres-style objects. Mm. At one time, I would have dated this probably in the 1860s and 1880s, but I've, I'm now revising that. I think these are much earlier, and I think this is about 1830 to 1840. Would have been a pair originally. Uh, it is a pair. It's still a pair. It is a pair. Oh, good. <laughs> In good condition? Uh, yes. I mean, they've got, a knot got crack tiny, um, slightly damaged top, but I mean... Yeah, that, otherwise it's fine. A slight chip, but I right. mean, the actual... Well, the painting here is so good. I mean, we've got a nice harvesting scene with a girl and a dog here. Well, very good subject, subject nice jeweling, in good condition, basically. And a pair like that, very saleable. Uh, and given even that damage, I think uh, somewhere around 1,800 to two and a half thousand pounds. Pleased? Oh, I'm absolutely staggered. She needs to go into hospital, <laughs> I think, quite <laughs> frankly. Tell me how you, you came to have her. Well, I ran a toy shop, didn't I, Claire, yes. in, in, the, when, in Devon. And an old lady came one day and said to me, would I like to buy her? Um, because she felt she ought to get rid of her before she died and give her a good home. And I said, yes. So that was about 1975. Yes, yes. And did you pay a lot for her? I paid her what she asked, which was £100, yes. which I thought was a lot at the time. There, there is a, a pair to this, um, i.e. they're known as either Hansel or Gretel. Yes. By the manufacturers, who yes. are Kammer or Kemer with an umlaut on the A, yes. and Reinhardt. Yes. Um, a German manufacturers who were um, operating in Thuringia, which is now the centre of Germany and was in the east. Oh, really? Um, yeah. There were very big uh, porcelain-making factories and doll factories in that part of Germany. Mm. Um, sadly, very few remain. Now, this is one of the porcelain ones which was registered in 1909 by Cameron Reinhardt. Oh, really? it's, it's, it's much earlier than I thought, yes. Um, I'm going to just show the back of the head to you because I'm sure you, you've seen that. It just actually says 114 yep. incised in the porcelain and fired again. Yep. Now, 114, if you were to call me and say I have a KR 114, I would know exactly what it looked like yes. because it is a mould. Um, and they poured in the porcelain into the molten porcelain into a mould. Now underneath that it says 49. Now that is the size, 49 centimetres. So that tells me pretty well all I want to know. I just need to know that she's in good condition. I think someone's kissed her tip of her nose quite a lot. Yes, so do I, yes. <laughs> it wasn't me. 
It wasn't you. It wasn't you. You kept her very well. Um, so slightly rubbed on the nose and just little tiny bits of white here where little scratches. Her um, colour's good though, isn't it? Her cheek colour. She's got really good, good, good colour yeah. and lovely painted blue eyes. Now, had she glass eyes, she'd be probably worth double. It's, really? qu it's quite extraordinary. Yeah. It's probably because they're rarer. Um, and to make her sit, she has these um, very good joints. <laughs> So they're, they're creaking a bit. <laughs> like me. <laughs> well, I haven't heard you creak. <laughs> um, nice original dress. Um, not original shoes. I made them. You made them? <laughs> oh, well, very well made. And a lovely little doll, all bisque, uh, which is her baby. Yes. Sweet little doll. Yes. I would say that if she were to go into a doll sale, yeah. You would probably get in the region of three, maybe three and a half thousand pounds for her. What? It's going to her eventually, <laughs> isn't it? Aren't you lucky? Very interested. Really, why is she so valuable? These Cameron Reinhardts are extremely valuable. Um, the world record for any doll at auction is a Cameron Reinhardt. Really? 188,000 pounds. Hmm. Put those down there. Oh, look at these. Well, these are three very pretty and, in fact, beautiful plates, actually. I'd love to find out where you found them or how you acquired them, where they inherited. Well, they're inherited from my grandfather. Yes. Uh, he collected them and it was one of his hobbies. Mm. Well, he got some nice examples here. I mean, if you're starting with this, which is actually a coal port plate, rather in the, the Welsh manner. Uh, it's a very pretty thing. Um, and that's probably worth, say, £100. Um, this is a very pretty plate here. Um, do you know what this is? No, no, nothing look, at look all. Look at the back it. and you see Chelsea, Chelsea red anchor yeah. mark. So it's a mid 18th century English porcelain plate from the Chelsea factory. Moulded in rather the Meissen style and beautifully painted. There are some minor imperfections here, but yeah. it's actually like pull the value down a bit. But that's probably probably would fetch something in the order of 450 to 550 pounds. Um, this plate here is quite the most sumptuous thing. I would hazard a guess it may be even one of the most beautiful pieces of continental porcelain we've had in the Antiques Roadshow. Mm. It doesn't take you know, a great expert to see the incredible quality of painting. No. Do you know what factory it is? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. It. No. Well, in a way. It's, 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 a German, it's a German porcelain factory of Nymphenburg. Um, turning it round here, you will see the mark. There's a sort of impressed mark of a shield, which is yeah, actually the yeah. Bavarian shield. These plates were, were probably met, come from um, the, the service which was made for the electoral court. Um, now, they are wonderfully painted by a man called uh, Joseph Zechenberger, who specialised in doing this superb botanical subjects and marvellous insects and also a sumptuous gilding. Now we get on to the business of, of what one thinks it's worth. Um, it's nice that sometimes one can be fairly precise. In this particular example, I do happen to know that two plates from this service uh, came up for auction in Geneva, where they generally they sell very yeah, well in that yeah. particular location. Uh, do you know any idea what you reckon they made? No idea. No idea. So. <laughs> do you want to hazard a guess? No, thousand. Well, you're a little bit on the conservative side. You know, one made last year the equivalent of eight thousand pounds. <laughs> so who does this belong to? Me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Explain. It was in my family for a long time, and then. Um, we didn't have much money uh, when we were newly married, and my friend here um, I had a more. Yeah. <laughs> and a Welsh dresser to put, put some empty, of it. Empty, empty shelves, so. so we split it. You split it? Yes. Now, how did you go about splitting a service? Because this is always an interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> you just took enough to fit on the dresser, I think, really. Yeah. Oh, I see. And I, I chose pieces that I like, so Anne's always maintained that I've got the best. <laughs> 
and she's left with a chip oh, one. How long have you <laughs> been friends? <laughs> long time. Nearly 30 years. Yeah. So we're nothing, still friends. So there's yeah. nothing I'm going to tell you now that's going to cause a schism? No. no. I want to know, how many pieces have you got then? I've got, have I got 22 or yeah, something? something like that. And uh, we've got a total of, what, 40-odd 40 40 pieces 40-odd, yeah. I've yeah, counted yeah. them out, actually. Yeah. When did it first come into your family? It was in my family when I was a little girl. We used to use it at Christmas. I think it was my grandmother's, because uh, she lived with us. Um, and I suspect it was her mother's. Right. This pattern is a pattern, well-known pattern, from the Mason's Ironstone production. Now, Mason's Ironstone get going in the sort of 18, 10, 15 period. Uh, they finally go bankrupt in the 1850 period, and then they're bought out by another factory called Ashworth's. And then much later, another 50 years on, Ashworth's are bought by Wedgwood. Now, people who had large services in the 19th century, and if they liked them, they would go back to the people who made them uh, as pieces got broken. Uh, they would say, well, make me some more of, of this particular pattern. And they would look on the back of the dish, and they would say, well, I've got a, a pattern 136 from your pattern book. Okay? And they would say, make me some more. There is a difference, because this is a replacement. Can you see what the difference is? Mm, this is, this is well, ready, ready, ready. That's right. These are, yeah. They are using the same transfer print plates to produce the transfer prints for the purple outline that forms the design. But the difference between these replacements and the earlier plates, and you can see it here, is that we've got that those panels are sort of purple ground mm -hmm. in the replacements, whereas they're deep blue ground in the original. Uh -huh. Now, that has some sort of a bearing on the overall value of the service. Very heavy as yeah, well, yes. in incredibly yes. heavy duty. I hope you've got a strong dresser yeah. at home. Um, now, I'm going to ask you, how much was the money for? How much was the loan? Oh. We had a discussion about this earlier, and we're not sure, but I thought it was 35. And I thought it was 85. So. 35 pounds? Yeah. Or 85 yes. pounds? Yeah. Yeah. And that was how long ago? 20, 20, 20, 20 odd years, years ago. ago. Okay. <laughs> we are about to cause an international incident here. No, no, no we're not. No, 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 you won't. No, we'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, as it stands. <laughs> I used to keep it in a dustbin as well. Forgot to tell you that bit. You kept it in a dustbin. Yeah, yeah. I had That's no way. That's why you valued it at, at thirty-five yeah. or fifty pounds. Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, if you sold this service as it is today, you'd probably get between three and uh, three and four thousand pounds for it. Gosh. Gosh. <laughs> Having 35 quid back. Yeah. <laughs> well, they are hands, they are really hands. No. No. I'll, no. I'll will them to you, my oh, heart. Oh, all right. <laughs> if you must. What do you think they are? Well, all we know about them is that they're Bavarian, we think. Mm. And, and um, sort of how old? Um, we think sort of middle to late 1700s. 18th century. 18th think century, they are. yeah. Well, yes. Um, well, now, they have early marks on them. They, they have this little mark, which is the crown above two cross C's, which I suppose you look up in marks books. Is that what you did? And, uh, yes. and find their 18th century. But I, I'm rather afraid they're not. Um, if they had been 18th century, the colours would have been totally different. The glaze would have been very much greyer. Um, less sort of white and boisterous colours like this. They'd have more subtlety about them. I, I'm afraid they actually come from Rudolstadt in Thuringia, which is now part of Germany, part of East Germany. So they are German, but they're, I think, perhaps early 20th century. They're more likely, say, somewhere around about 1900, 1914. <laughs> I hope that's not terribly no. disappointing. <laughs> but um, this, this mark is one of those great confusing marks yes. that you look up in books and think, my God, it's 18th century. But this is a repro, as it were, copying the basic styles of the period, but doing it very much more recently. Yeah. Um, now, that's not to say they're not valuable, because, uh, I mean, they're very decorative and uh, very complicated to make. And um, it, as far as I can see, in superb condition. So, I mean, if, if thinking in terms of value, they're, they're now something like about 800 to 1,000 pounds. But not desperately old. <laughs> The dog's dinner, um, carved in a very unusual technique. This is all scratched in with a sharp tool when the clay was wet. Yes. And uh, it's actually a most unusual piece of royal Worcester porcelain uh -huh. because it's the work of a young artist called Albert Binns. The little AB, 1881, uh -huh. tells a very tragic tale. 
because he was 16 when he decorated your dish, and the following year he died. Um, he was uh, the son of the owner of the Worcester factory. He had enormous talent and was going to be, I think, a great career as an artist at the, the potteries. But he swallowed a cherry stone when he was eating some fruit, caught a disease from it, and died. And the owner of the factory, Robert William Binns, was devastated by that. And we see very, very rarely the work of young Albert Binns, yeah. because in just two years... 16. Uh -huh. That's right, he's just a teenager. Uh -huh. And in two years of potting, he produced a number of dishes like these. Uh -huh. So, where did you get that from? I got that from my mother. She got it from her mother. Right. And my mother uh, was... My mother 82, died. 82. 82. 82. Her, well, Mother, that, I don't know that where goes I'm right back right, doesn't it? They don't often come on the market, but when they do, they're quite expensive. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. A dish like this is worth about a thousand pounds. Oh, oh my that's goodness! Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Thanks very much. The sea captain came into the hotel, and apparently he couldn't pay his bill, and they had this off him as a collateral. This was could. given as payment in kind. In, in kind, yes. He just happened to have, have one it. in his bag. Well, it, it was on the board ship. Right. So he came into port, well, he went to this hotel, yeah, yes. he couldn't pay, they, and, they had this and he said, on board I've got one of these. Yes, yes and they took it as... Do you know when that was? Uh, in the early part of the century it was. Uh, right, the early 1900s. Uh, early 1900s, yes. Right. Where does it live today? It's in town. It's, it's, in, it's been in the front window, in the bay window. I've been married for 41 years, and it's, it was there when I was courting, and it hasn't moved. So that's the seat captain. What about this one? That, that is part of, it is all part of it. It was all part, part of, of the part same. same. Yes, yes. Now they're quite heavy objects. Yes, yes. And I have to admit, I did have a little sneak underneath yes. both of them just yes. earlier on. Yeah. Um, the fact is that this is slightly earlier than this one. I see. They yes. weren't made at the same time. I see. Yes. Yeah. Both of these objects are, belong to the huge group of uh, pottery wares coming out of Staffordshire in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, yes. known as Majolica ware, from uh, Italian wares of the Renaissance period. Yes. But this is straight out of China, really, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is, yes. It's basically yes. a yes. Chinese wood urn stand, but yes. done in pottery. Yes, yes. yes. With these wonderful uh, cabriole legs, legs and this yeah. typical chinoiserie apron yes. here. This yes. is actually dated uh, 1875. Yes. But this urn, which is in a completely different style, uh, is dated two years later. I see. Yes. This yes. is 1877, yes. and it's done in the Italian style. I mean, yeah. these pan masks, these pants sticking their tongues yes. out. I, I, do you ever get sort of unpleasant comments from people passing well, the window? The wife used to take uh, her friends in to frighten them. When, when they were little kids, they were little children. <laughs> <laughs> to frighten them? To frighten them, yes. Someone's yes. obviously looked after this because, yes. um, because there's a certain amount of spraying on yes. here. Tell me about that. Well, we didn't know about that till we started, well, somebody came down to the house uh, Saturday and then that's when it was noticed first. But someone in the family has been, been using a nice a metallic car spray right. paint. Oh. <laughs> oh, heck. Um, I suspect what's it. happened is yes. that at some stage that probably took frost damage. I see. And yes. the, the frost started to peel yeah. off the, the, uh, the, the glaze on top. Yes. And so someone went down to a local car emporium and bought a nice one of these I see sprays. Yes. I, I, I got a good idea with that one. I got <laughs> oh, a good idea, yes, yes. Oh, right. I hope he's, I haven't started any trouble. No, no, he's, he's not with us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but inside, this is the important thing, yes. inside there is no evidence of any damage. No. So uh, I'm not going to treat this too seriously. This is no. still not too bad. Now, you yes. say you've been using these to frighten people. Yes. Um, do you have any idea of value? Nothing at all. We have got no, not the foggiest idea of this. Right. Two pieces of mint and majolica ware, 1875, 1877. This one, just to frighten you, is probably worth somewhere between three and five thousand pounds. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And this one with the damage is yes. probably worth somewhere between four and seven thousand pounds. Yes, yes. A lot of money. <laughs> Even more frightening more than they yes. were oh, before. Yes, yes. So we'll have to be insured then. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> How many have you got? Well, I think 24 or 25. You've got a whole kennel in here. <laughs> How long have I you... I have bought any for uh, at least 15 years. And do you remember how expensive the I last know. one you bought? Well, how much I paid? Yeah. Well, I think probably 25 years ago, I probably paid about, some of the best, about 30. Ooh. 20 to 30. 20 to 30 pounds? Yeah. 
do you know which factories? Do you know which porcelain factories you have here? Oh, uh, uh. Most of these dogs were made uh. in Staffordshire, uh. dating to 1830, 1850. Right. I never see any nowadays. They are quite, uh, they are quite yeah. rare. I've got some, uh, you know, spaniels, large one, with uh, the basket of flowers. Yes. Oh, we've got some inkwells down here as well. I was hoping we might see these. Oh, aren't they pretty? Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Yeah, that's one of my favourite. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course... Uh, one damaged, isn't it? Uh, the crack, aren't they? That one. Yeah. Yes, you've got... They were used for a pet, weren't they? These are little inkwells. And fortunately, they have never been used for ink because, oh, no, I'm wrong, look, it had, this one has been used for ink. I was going to say, usually they take an awful stain. Yeah. Um, if you put ink into the bottom here, it soaks into the porcelain and it leaves you with yeah. this awful stain. But I think at some stage, fortunately, uh, they stopped using it and it is simply an ornament. Yeah. Well, I will just Don't see I... what we've got there. <laughs> Another inkwell. This is like Christmas at Crufts. You like the inkwell, I think the inkwell is gorgeous. I think this inkwell, if you buy one of those at auction today, you will have to spend about 400 pounds for one wow. inkwell. Yeah. Well, I think that each pair, as we go through here, let's give you an average. Each pair is probably worth between four and 700 pounds. But that's that. Each. Pair. Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two and a half thousand yeah. to four thousand pounds for that lot. Yeah. And I've given you values on those. Maybe a hundred to two hundred pounds each. Yeah. And maybe three to five hundred pounds for him yeah. alone. I think you've done very well. Thank you. It's a big pleasure to be able to have you to look at them. <laughs> a nice little tea set um, made somewhere about 1820, right. 1825. Yeah. Did it come down through the family to you? Yes, it was my grandmother. Oh, it's jolly nice. Yes, it'd probably be earlier than grandmother. Well, no, it's 170, 80 years old. Have you got more of the set, have you? Um, that's eight cups and saucers. Yes. Yes, it might have descended down from 12 cups and saucers. Oh. But um, apart from the, the missing cups and saucers, you've got all the shapes. Yeah. You've got the teapot and cover, you've got the slop basin, you've got the sugar bowl, yeah. uh, and um, milk jug, and um, one of the bread and butter plates. Uh, basically, the teapot handle is, is what we call the London shape. Oh, Not that right. it was made in London, but it was called the London shape. It was a very popular shape in London. I see. Uh, but this is made in Staffordshire by a firm called Hilditch uh, of Stoke-on-Trent. Right. Uh, and very attractive. They made a lot of designs very like this yeah. at that period. It's a nice printed pattern, um, outline printed, and then the painter has filled in the colours, the blues yeah. and the reds and the greens, like a child's colouring in book. And uh, it's a simple one, but very charming. Do you use the set? Oh, no. It's, it's a wee in the china cupboard. The way in the cupboard. Yeah. Yes. There wouldn't be any little tea plates no, at this time. that's what I was wondering about you the tea haven't plates. haven't got any. No. no, tea plates weren't thought of at that time. You didn't sit round round a table like, and have jam and sardines and things like that. What um, so uh, you, you sat round in an easy chair, the servant brought you a cup and saucer and a, and a, and a plate for the, oh, with a cake on right. it. So you're not missing those. You've got right. the whole set virtually. Right. Very nice. Do you, you enjoy it? Like oh, it? yes. Yeah. Good. Um, you worried about the value of it? Well, I'd like to know. I mean, it's not of enormous thought. value, no. but a little set like that with, um, say, about a couple of cups and saucers missing, um, it'll be worth around about... Five hundred pounds. Oh, very nice. It was made in about eighteen hundred and five, right. and I have never seen this pattern. I know where it's right. made. Right. This is a typical bit of coal pot porcelain. Uh huh. Uh, but the the quality of it is extremely high, particularly wonderful gilding here. Yes, yes. Really beautiful, and the condition is very good. So this is one plate. You've got some more. Yes, we have. Yes, there's about uh, there's eleven altogether. 
it's two uh, terrines and two platters to go with the terrines and an oval dish as well. I would think that if you wanted to replace your service, you would have to <laughs> shell out something with the order of £4,000. Oh. Uh, but it's an absolute gem and, as I say, wonderful pattern. Mm. It must be frightfully rare because I've not seen it before. <laughs> wonderful. Well, basically, um, they're my mother-in-law's, um, which I think she got hold of about 35 years ago. She actually paid £160 for them. Right. The, the work of Charlie Baldwin, the Royal Worcester factory, yes. and Charlie Baldwin um, specialised in swans. I mean, during right. his career he painted um, many, many hundreds of vases, but usually with swans flying around the vases. What makes these so unusual is the swans are swimming. <laughs> And yeah, that really does make them different. Mm -hmm. um, and we're interested to see just what date they are, were painted. Uh, they'll have a mark on the bottom for the factory year code. Right. Uh, the um, year, year mark, a little dots around the Worcester factory mark. And here, this one's got eight dots. That makes it 1899. 1899. And, and that is um, that makes sense because that's quite early for this decoration. Oh, right. Most of Charlie Baldwin's swan vases are painted between 1900 and 1904. And they were very formal pattern, but they're not very detailed. These are well, really much, much more real swans, but they look more fluffy. And that's, I think, very typical of the early work of Charlie Baldwin. Mm -hmm. uh, he did the whole lot, all the decoration. Um, he will have signed them. Uh, his signature is just there, neatly painted, C. Baldwin. Huh? And well, not, not, not ignore the vases themselves, these modelling of the handles by James Hadley. I mean, the whole concept just works together so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a new, light, airy style of decoration which Worcester was just working out, and they were to become enormously popular. Right. Um, both at the time and, and indeed now. So we've got to look at, say, £15,000, perhaps even £20,000. Really? Gosh, I'd be happy with that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Really good.